What are you doing for the key? Every really giving everything to the one who gave his all for you. Well, now, don't you be satisfied just to know that the Lord is saved. Have you forgotten what you need to do? Take up your cross, follow Jesus. Take up your cross every day. Don't you be ashamed. Say that you know him. Count the cost, take up your cross, and follow him. Good morning. Let's stand up and sing. What do you say? All right, we're going to divide the room right down the middle here. Lee Iyer. Everybody, Lee, raise your hand, Lee. Y'all see that hand? God bless you. We see that hand. Everybody on that side of the room singing with Sean. Everybody on this side of the room, you're singing with me. I'll apologize to everybody on this side of the room right now. <laughs> and we'll do our best to keep up. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised? Who is worthy to be praised? So shall I be saved so shall from my enemies. I, I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon So shall I be saved, so shall from, my I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. 
I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised? Who is worthy to be praised? So shall I be saved so from my I enemies. Be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be Take a minute and greet your neighbor. Maybe find somebody you haven't met before and tell them good morning. That's great. Go on the way every time. Yeah, every time. All right, you might know this song. Hey, why don't, you, why, why don't you stand up for a minute longer? I think you might know this song. follow that up. I have already come. Tears grace has brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me so fair. 
All right, I love this last verse the best. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than with the words a little bit. So if you're reading along, I'll just I'll say I'm sorry. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, see how great. How great is our God. Let's do that again because I can't screw that up. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great. How great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. I promise I'm almost done, the lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God, oh, we'll sing how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. You're the name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great. Our God. <laughs> you threw us a curveball right there. Uh, you know it. Well, we have a, uh, the Cokes are getting good at this. That's what I'm going <laughs> to say. <coughs> Almost two years ago, Joe and Catherine Cope brought their son, Joseph Duffy Cope III, right there for dedication. And today they bring Drennan Catherine Cope for the same. And in the, I, ha I have no water to use because... Her mother was baptized while she was pregnant with her, so we figured that would, you know. <laughs> what a beautiful family this is. And I'm so happy to participate in this today, and they have family with them as well today. A whole, a whole 
relatives of family, so we're glad they are here. Joe and Catherine, you are acknowledging that this child has come from God as a gift to you, that your vocation as parents is to raise and love her in such a way that she grow up to love and serve others and love and serve God all the days of her life. Today, you formally recognize that responsibility and not only dedicate her, but you dedicate yourselves to that loving task. And as you give her to the Lord, she will be received. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them. Joe and Catherine, you have shared in God's creative power, bringing into the world this beautiful new life. Will you pledge to support and love Drennan by providing the opportunity for her to grow up in the family of faith with the hope that she will someday follow Christ into the kingdom of God? If so, please respond by saying we will. We will. will you, to the best of your ability and with God's help, provide a loving family environment in which she can grow in love toward her neighbor, neighbors and toward her God? If so, please respond by saying we will. Will you encourage Drennan to grow in faith so that she will put her whole trust in the person of Christ? Will you encourage her so that she might be one who will live out the redemptive purposes of God? If so, respond by saying we will. We will. Joe and Catherine, along with other members of Drennan's family, have expressed their trust in God and in us by presenting this child for dedication. If you will pledge your support and loving presence, in time of ease and in difficulty, in times of joy and sorrow, in times of growth and frustration. If you will pledge to be faithful witnesses for Christ in upholding this family, and especially this little one, would you please respond by saying, yes, we will. Drennan, we dedicate and consecrate your life to God on this day. May the Lord Jesus Christ give you his grace, his love, and his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you his peace today and all the days of your life. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ the blesser of children. This is Drennan Tilton. You who are on the road must have coal that you can live by and so become yourself because the past is just a goodbye it teach your children well your father's hell did it feed them on your dream the one they pick, the one you know by. Don't you ever ask them why? If they told you you would cry, 
So just look at them and sigh And know they love you In you of tender years can't know the fears your elders grew by and so please help them with your youth they seek the truth before they can die and teach your parents well their children's hell will slowly go by and feed them on your dreams the ones they pick the one you'll know by Don't you ever ask them why if they told you you'd cry It teach Your parents will Your children's hell will slowly go mad free them on your dreams the ones they pick the one you'll know by and don't you ever ask them why if they told you you would cry to just look at them and sigh and know they love you. My phone, I don't make a habit of that during church, though some of you do. <laughs> I have a son on his way to Navarre, I have a son in El Salvador, and I have a wife and son playing baseball this morning in Carabelle. Probably. They, they need somebody to play. They're facing an elimination game this morning right now. They're down two to nothing in the second inning, so just so you know. And my dogs are at home wondering what in the world is going on. Why ain't anybody at home? So, uh, a lot of distractions this morning. And, and, and the British Open's on, which is you know, just outstanding. So if you are checking your phone, if you could wave a score at some point, that would be just fine. Yeah, Tiger didn't even make the cut. So anyway, if you ask me what, what you are speaking on, Today, I would answer that I'm taking the New Testament reading from the Revised Common Lectionary as my text. The Revised Common Lectionary is a weekly catalog of scripture readings. It's not a little devotional book. It's 600 pages of Bible verses, prayers, and guidelines for weekly worship. It is based on the Roman Catholic Lectionary but adapted for use in Protestant churches it is a vital part of Episcopal and Anglican churches, Lutheran, Presbyterian, and some Methodist churches. 
Although I think the Methodist Church adapts theirs to the Book of Order or something like that. Billy, does that sound right? Book of Discipline, thank you, yes. And so when we speak of liturgical churches, those typically are the churches that follow the revised common lectionary so that churchgoers can hear a rounded voice of Scripture week by week. Each Sunday, there are suggested readings from the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Gospels, and the Epistles. And this is a portion of the reading from the Epistles today being read right now in hundreds of thousands of churches in the English-speaking world. From Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their heart. In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. The word of God for the people of God this day. You know... I wish that I could gather soundbite samples from today's sermons across the English-speaking world based on this text. I would like to know how the golden-tongued pulpiteers deal with this most delicate of subjects, circumcision. Every man in the room flinched when I said the word. (laughs) Though our female counterparts are not likely to show us very much compassion about it. Until we have put on a hospital gown and endured the annual indignity of stirrups and a pap smear, I doubt we will be comforted over a procedure that occurred with proper anesthetic and before we gain the capacity for consciousness. Now this doesn't mean that this simple operation is not without dangers. Doc Hall, who ran the clinic in my hometown for decades, showed up early one morning to deliver a newborn baby boy, hydrated by moonshine and drunker than a wheelbarrow, I was told. And his resulting attempt to circumcise the child ended with a disaster. An epic disaster still talked about in hushed and forbidden tones 40 years after the fact. Nothing strikes fear into a man's soul like that sort of mishap as it threatens, let's be honest, his most prized and guarded possession. I'm just telling the truth. With that kind of risk, why do we do this? This ritual, it's insane. Well, there are a couple of reasons. The first is cultural. Conformity, you might say. In a society where circumcision is widely practiced and accepted, parents have the procedure performed on their baby boys so they'll be like all the other baby boys. And isn't it interesting that in this individualistic society, we all sort of have to look the same. In some cultures, circumcision is an initiation into manhood. This is especially true of the aboriginal tribes of Australia 
and to a lesser degree in Africa. Jewish boys have a bar mitzvah. Christian boys have a baptism or a confirmation. In Aboriginal cultures, circumcision served as the passageway into adulthood for a boy. There is one particular tribe where the boys, as they reach puberty, go through a period of testing. They spend nights alone in the woods, acts of strength, hunting, bravery, things like that. And finally, after they have passed the appropriate test, they are allowed to be circumcised. The boy is placed naked on the ground, his arms extended, palms up, and stones are stacked in each hand. And if he flinches while the shaman performs the ceremony and the rocks fall, he has to go back and repeat the tests of manhood all over again until he can endure it without spilling the rocks. He is not considered a man. Hmm. But for the most part, circumcision is a religious practice. The native tribes of the Americas, some African nations, Egyptians, Muslims, they all practice or practice ritual circumcision of boys as an exercise of their religion, as strange as that may sound to us. And this is especially true of Jews. On the eighth day of the boy's life, even if it is the Sabbath or a holy day, on the eighth day of the boy's life, as commanded by God to Abraham, way back in Genesis, the family gathers. An empty chair is pulled aside for the prophet Elijah, should he choose to materialize. The rabbi, or a designated holy person, not a physician, holds the scalpel. The baby is given a few drops of wine to dull his senses. And the father says, blessed are you, our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to bring this boy into the covenant of Abraham. And the skin is cut, and the family rejoices, the child screams, and everyone goes out and has bagels. I cannot overemphasize this enough. As infant baptism is to a devout Catholic, as praying toward Mecca would be to a Muslim, as the sinner's prayer is for an evangelical. Nothing is more important for traditional Judaism than circumcision. It is an outward sign, commanded by God, of the inner participation in God's covenant with Israel to refuse to be circumcised or to have your boy circumcised and there's no female equivalent, is to break faith with God. The penalty in Hebrew is called karet. It means to cut off. If you will not be cut, then you will be cut off from God, His community, your family, and everything that you have called home. It is absolutely essential to Jewish identity. Someone, someone in this room, sent me a little story a few years ago thinking that I would never have an opportunity probably to use it, but the text demands it today. A Catholic priest, a Baptist preacher, and a rabbi who live in the North Woods were once challenged because preaching to people is easy. Getting converts of people is easy. The real challenge would be, the opponent declared, to preach to a bear. Well, one thing led to another, and they decided to all go out in the woods and find a bear and preach to it and attempt to convert it. A week later, they all came together to discuss their experiences. Father Flannery was first. He had his arm in a sling, and he was on crutches, and he said, Well, I started with the catechism, but obviously to no avail. That bear started smacking me around, but I threw some holy water at him, and he, he became as gentle as a lamb, and he's taking his first communion next week. Baptist Bob was in a wheelchair, had both legs and cast and an IV drip, and he said, well, brothers, you know we don't sprinkle. I began to read to my bear from God's holy word, but that bear wanted nothing to do with it, so I took hold of him, and we wrestled up one hill and down another until we tumbled down to a creek, and I took him and dunked him under the water, and he got saved, and we spent the rest of the day praising Jesus. 
the rabbi was laying in a hospital bed. His body in a cast and traction almost dead. And he looked up at his brothers and said, Thinking back on it now, maybe circumcision was not the best place to start with a bear. But what choice would he have? If you or I were converting to Judaism, men, that would be the first requirement. For this is where faith begins for the Jewish people. Not just because God commanded it, but because symbolically it is where life begins. When Jews were threatened by extinction, by the Philistines, later by the Babylonians, then the Greeks, then the Persians, the Spanish Inquisition, most recently the Nazi Holocaust, they were still circumcising their boys when a check of the boy's body could be a death sentence. Babies born, and there were babies born in the Nazi labor camps, baby boys born in those Nazi labor camps were still on the eighth day in a blessed holy ceremony circumcised. To stop it would be to give up their faith and to give up their identity. Modern rabbis explain the further symbolism of the act by stressing that we aren't born perfect. The way we enter this world requires some work. The Jewish faith doesn't adhere to original sin in the same way that Catholics and Reformed Protestants do, and that's probably a good thing, but they certainly acknowledge that humanity is lacking. We are incomplete and left in our natural state, left to ourselves, left to our animalistic instincts and natural tendencies. We will never please God or become the humanity that God has given us the ability and potential to be. The negative traits, our lowly innate faults, these have to be refined. Our tendencies to harm ourselves and our world, these have to be redeemed. As Rabbi Aaron Moss says, so we put a sign on the most physical and primal organ, the very seed of life, to symbolize that whatever is not as it should be must be cut away. Now, all that said, you know that anything this important, anything this essential to one's cultural, personal, and religious identity can become a problem. It can become an object of pride that it goes from being something distinctive to being something divisive. And that is the context of Ephesians 2. Remember how the text begins? Don't forget that you Gentiles, that's a non-Jew, used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. Two groups were coming together to form the early church. On one side, there were the heathen, the uncivilized Gentiles, Romans, Greeks, Europeans, Africans, people who had been polytheistic, who had worshipped planets and idols and animals and vainful philosophies. And they are exposed to Jesus and they learn a new way to live and a new way to be and they are converted but they collide up against this other group that composed the early church, the Jews, who were monotheistic, who believed and worshipped the one true God and always had. And they were like Jesus, because Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was one of them. Jesus was their Messiah. He fulfilled all that they had hoped for. And so you have these that, that have always been followers of God, always looking for Messiah, and you have these rowdy, rough-around-the-edges outsiders who show up and start taking over the church. These Johnny-come-latelys, these upstart whippersnappers who showed up with their fair skin and their blue eyes, speaking a foreign language, and taking the lead role in the church and proper spirituality that the Jews had always dominated. And worst of all, they were uncircumcised. Correct. They should not be allowed into the church. 
And you won't believe this. But in the first century, the biggest fight the Jerusalem church had and the struggle that, they, that, was, that was most crippling to the church was whether or not when the Gentile is converted, he should submit to the rites of circumcision. <laughs> they were letting a ritual, an important ritual nonetheless, but they were letting a ritual divide the church. As Paul says, the Gentiles used to be outsiders, deserving of scorn maybe, but not anymore. Verse 14 of the text, Christ united Jews and Gentiles into one people. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He ended the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Incredible, far-reaching words. Words echoed by the same writer to the Galatian church because this problem was always cropping up. When Paul said to the Galatian believers, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God's intention through Jesus was to bring humanity back together again and end the religious division. You know, from our very Gentile perspective, we're tempted to think, well, how could folks let something like a little old snip of the skin in the first month of one's life and something completely irrelevant to women tear the church apart? That, that is just ridiculous. Is it? There are entire Christian denominations built around such minute differences. Like how much water should be used at baptism. A few drops or an entire ocean. Fellowship is broken over such things. Should we have a pipe organ, electric guitars, or no musical instruments whatsoever? Four different churches will be born out of that argument and the congregations will never speak to each other again about it. What version of the Bible do you carry? One translated in the 17th century or the 21st century? If yours is too new, it's wrong. How do you read the book of Revelation? Are you an allegorist, a literalist, a preterist, an amillennial, premillennial, or postmillennial? Or are you into covenant theology and not a millennialist at all? Do you think Daniel's 70 weeks have already been fulfilled, or are we waiting on that for Revelation 13? I'm not being cute. People fight about this sort of thing. People who call the same Jesus Lord, but if you don't line up exactly with what I believe, then I can't have fellowship with you. I can't go to church with you. I can't even be seen. With you. Now, when you look at it like that, you discover that the arguments going around in the first century really aren't that much different than the arguments in the 21st century. And do I need to remind us that Christianity for 1,500 years, or at least 500 since the Protestant Reformation, has been divided into three major camps? simply on what kind of meaning we give to that bread and that cup right there? What drives these arguments and these divisions? It's not doctrine. Although some people want to say it is. It's not adherence or denial of the way or the truth of God. It is selfishness. It is pride. It is the unstoppable desire to be superior to somebody else. I got the real truth, and you don't. It is exactly as the scriptures say. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? They come from the evil desires at war within you. You are jealous, so you fight and wage war for whatever there is. 
And wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you can rest assured that you will find disorder of every kind. Show me where someone is fighting about religious rituals or theological minutia, and I'll show you not a doctrinal war, but a war of egos. Because it's not about humbly following Christ, which is what should bind us together. It's about being superior and vanquishing your competitor. It's about taking what is good and blessed and symbolically right and making it wrong by using it as a weapon against those to whom you feel superior. Happens in the church all the time. Now, I didn't realize that circumcision would be such an interesting, consuming topic. So much so that I haven't even finished the text. And I'll do that next week and talk more about the solution that Paul offers to our rivalries and our competitive spirits. But I'll finish today by, by quoting Garrison Keller. He too made the observation that religious schism is hardly ever the result of doctrinal differences. Rather, it is usually, quote, prompted by feuds between alpha males equipped with 18-point antlers of righteous dogma. <laughs> Religion just becomes a tool in the age-old competition of being king of the mountain. My grandmother had a rather plain, if not vulgar, phrase for these testosterone-driven battles to prove who was bigger, better, and stronger. I'll not repeat it. <laughs> but you know it. Or a variation of it. Um, no, Lenny, I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> but isn't it ironic? And I'm done with this. Isn't it ironic that circumcision is used by Paul to draw attention to that same problem in the church? It is not coincidence that he will hit us where it hurts. Because our pride and our ego and our ambition and our aggression are the very things that hurt others and tear the church and the world apart. And we'll pick it up right there next week. Pray with me if you would. Lord, cut away from us our selfishness and our self-centeredness. Make us into the men, women, children who would follow Christ humbly, gently, deferring to others and submitting to you. Help us to see others not as competition, but as our brothers and sisters in Christ on a common journey. And it is in Christ we pray. I invite you to the Lord's table to celebrate the unity of God's people and God's church.
is broken like that first morning like bird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for Praise for them springing fresh from the world. Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven, like that first dew fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the way God sprung in completeness where he sleeps. Mine is the sunlight. Mine is the morning born of the first light Eden saw play praise with elation praise every morning God's recreation of the new day morning has broken like the first morning like the spoken like that first bird Praise for the singing, praise for the morning, praise for them springing fresh from the
no more shame. Marching to Zion, we've gone to see Jesus in a home far away. great song here we haven't done in a number of years and uh, we'll go back and sing through uh, what's printed there anyway there's about 20 verses to it because Sean Dietrich wrote this song and uh, we're the we're the only ones that he's ever sang it with and we like it we like it so, uh, it's been a long time though that was a long time ago let's sing this thing man. no As we pray today, let's especially remember the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the awful shooting that has taken place this past week. There are just too many of these days where we have to pause about such things. I know that uh, we have friends and family in that area. And my wife actually attended high school with one of the victims' mother. And, uh, it's the city where Nancy McConnell's mother was the congressional representative for years. So it's close to home for a lot of folks. Let's take a moment of silence and remember these five young men. And then we'll pray together. Lord, we pray for your grace for our brothers and sisters hundreds of miles away, but we enter into them with their, with their pain and the madness of it all, and situations where there are no explanations. We ask you to be near those suffering families. We ask you to be near us and help us some way by your love and grace to counter the violence of this world with the power of Christ. Empower us, Lord, to do that. For the many other requests that are circulating, including Nina's dear friend who's been diagnosed with cancer and other concerns, we ask that you be very real and very present to those who need you. As Jesus has taught us to pray, we pray boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven,
special congrats to the Copes again today. Thanks for, for what you're doing. And little Joe just clapped. He claps every time there's amen. I love that. Do you not let him eat until he prays? Is that what it is? Because sometimes that happens. But uh, uh, it's two to two in the bottom of the third, by the way. So uh, yeah. it's good. It's good. There's a, there's a little play going on in Defuniac Springs today. It's the last show, Grit and Grace, and uh, i got to go to it right now. So uh, I'll leave this last song. We, I know you do. I know you do. We went and saw the play last night, me and Tim and a whole mess of other people from church, and it was really something else. And Sean dared me to wear my Western shirt today. <laughs> I dared him to bring his. Well, I He's, no, him. don't say too yeah, much. Sir. Don't say too much. So you, you Ron is not just, wrote, he didn't just write the play. He's an actor in the play. So when you see him get up very on the stage, short, it's very, really exciting. Very short, very short. All those cat calls coming from the audience were coming from us. Really? Yeah. I thought it was Judy. No, we were like, ow! I that could hear me. Judy talking, like on the front row, like she is right now. Hey, 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 you up there. You know, stuff like that is yeah. great. But you can't see anything with the lights. <laughs> Do what? The under <laughs> Tim just said the underwear was his. He threw it on stage. But anyway. <laughs> I'm going to leave on that one, sir. <laughs> oh, God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh, God, you are my God, and I seek you in the morning and if I don't wake up I'll do it a little later and step by step you'll lead me and I will follow you all of my days take us to school man Billy, I do it to you because you can. Come on, Stuart. His guitar is worth more than my house. Oh, God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. I don't have a very nice house, though. Oh, God, you 